Okay, uh, thanks David very much for introducing. Um, and, uh, today I'm going to talk about value-centric blockchain. As you read from the title, it's very similar to what Philip had just said. And uh, so unfortunately, this, the content of this one is also very similar to a lot of speakers has already said. Uh, but I'm just kidding, it's not uh, very unfortunate because I can safely omit some of the contents in this slide, so it may be shorter. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, skip these slides. Uh, so sorry about the world of text shows on uh, each slide because the animation is gone. Uh, okay, so uh, I actually was about to ask the same question that Philip was <laughs> Asking, so, so what is the main functionality of blockchain? Uh, what we use blockchain for? But my answer would be that we mainly use that for value transfers. And that is basically what Bitcoin used uh, first design blockchain for. And then as, as, as of this moment, most of the blockchains still use this as the major functionality of uh, allow value transfer. Uh, and for, uh, for to allow value transfer, there is something... Uh, uh, we, we basically let all node to keep a consistent state. And uh, so it's also very fortunate that uh, Mustafa has already uh, introduced the concept of the state. So in most of the, in Bitcoin, in Ethereum, we, uh, the state it can be represented as just accounts and balances. And for UTXO, it's a little bit uh, uh, hazy at the first place why it is account and balance, but in fact it is also account and balance. So all nodes need to keep a consistent state, uh, and the blocks is, are, are simply the inputs, which is the, uh, the, the states, the transition from one state to another. And what we are trying to do is... Uh, oh. Uh, yeah, there is something because it, it seems to be my old slides. <laughs> uh, wow. Okay. Let me see where I am. I. Uh, excuse me. I have my new slides in my laptop, but uh, it seems to be the old one, so I need to kind of uh, find where am I. But uh, sorry if my uh, speech is a little bit off the slides. Uh, I try to be as clear as possible. Uh, the, the thing is, okay, so all nodes need to have a consistent state, which is bad because then the system is not scalable. Uh, well, it's not scale out, so exactly as Philip said, we will have this constant line of uh, throughput so no matter how many nodes you have, you will always have a constant uh, throughput. Uh, but then, uh, if you want to uh, scale out, you always need to say that uh, a node uh, only needs to, st uh, to acquire part of the state transition, part of the state transition records. And we do that by making some assumptions, or uh, let's say we by do that by sacrifice a little bit at security or uh, uh, trust uh, or, or decentralization. So the assumption is that or either we said there are uh, fewer nodes, fewer malicious nodes than uh, one third of the uh, population, uh, so that we can shard the network uh, securely. Or we said there are a certain group of nodes in this network is more trustworthy than the others, so we can let them to check uh, the validator transactions for us. So by making these assumptions, we remove the redundancy so that the nodes only need to acquire part of the, trans uh, the transaction record. Uh, okay, that is also the things that we want to do here, but uh, we want to first uh, look at something called rationality. Uh, so let's uh, take a page uh, back from uh, what uh, Nakamoto to uh, told us. So uh, in Bitcoin, so wh why is Bitcoin different from a traditional BFT system? So if someone was here, I think Sarah addressed this problem a little bit yesterday. She said that uh, the Bitcoin and the difference between Bitcoin and BFT, one of the, uh, the major difference is the, uh, is the incentive. Uh, but I think I want to dig a little bit further into that. So what is the uh, main difference between Bitcoin and the uh, traditional BFT is that in Bitcoin, we are dealing something which is valuable. We are dealing with money. And people have a very strange behavior when we are dealing with money. And 
so we always want more money and we don't throw away money. So basically, our, uh, in traditional BFT, uh, Byzantine faults, uh, Byzantine nodes are assumed to be, uh, to perform arbitrary attacks. But when we are dealing with money, our actually uh, behavior is restricted to a certain pattern. And because of that, uh, we call that rationality. So we, with the assumption be a change from honest node and malicious node to rational nodes. And that is actually what we want to, uh, to emphasize today is the rationality. And the rationality, one of the most famous one is that the rational nodes will try to get as my, many mining rewards as possible. And that's a trick that Bitcoin is playing and Bitcoin uh, use this incentive as a carrot in front of donkey so to, to make miners playing this uh, solving puzzle game uh, to achieve BFT in a larger scale. And, but there are some certain uh, other rationalities which uh, has been mislooked in, in my opinion, uh, although that we are implicitly using that because we thought that is so trivial because that's the way we deal with money. And we are trying to point out those rationality. So one of the example is why do we pay transaction fee at the first place? I think the clear answer is that we want to make transaction, right? So that's why we pay transaction fee to the miners. Uh, so uh, we also pay transaction to fee to Visa. So when I made the transaction to David, uh, okay, I will send some money to David with, uh, through Visa and Visa provide the service of confirming my transaction, that's why we pay him the transaction fee. So if minor is in the place of the Visa, then it's natural that I need to pay a minor transaction fee. But the thing is, why do we need Visa in the first place? So basically, because we want to uh, make sure the Visa uh, help us to make sure that the transaction is confirmed. So basically, David, well, David doesn't trust me if we well, David doesn't trust me. And, and so we, I, if I said, okay, I send you uh, some money, and he wouldn't trust me. And actually, he, but he and me and a lot of people in the world trust Visa. So when Visa said, okay, this transaction is confirmed, then David knows that uh, he can securely use this money to send it to someone else. So basically, we need uh, Visa to actually help us confirm the transaction. But the key, but the, the thing in here is that why is, I'm paying the transaction fee instead of David paying the transaction fee. Because there is a, some rationality that we're dealing with value that as a, uh, as, a, as a transaction issuer, I am in responsibility of uh, provide him some proof that my transaction is confirmed. And I do that through miner because I send some transaction fee to the miner and miner put that on chain and then I send the chain as a proof to David saying that, okay, see, my transaction is confirmed, it is on chain. And then David check the chain and see, okay, so this transaction is indeed confirmed. But the rationality in here is that, okay, as a transaction issuer, I am uh, in, I, am, uh, I should take responsibility of sending a proof saying that my transaction is confirmed. And then there's another rationality. Uh, as a receiver, as David, should also check uh, that my transaction is confirmed. And there is a third, well, mm -hmm, the third rationality is gone. Okay, those, there is a third rationality saying that, okay, so if David has this value, uh, he should actually hold the proof saying that uh, this value belongs to him uh, so that he can use that to prove to someone else that when he makes the transaction. And this rationality, I didn't make up this rationality. I just sum up the rationality people are using uh, in previous works. So for example, the, the rationality of value holding, which is not here, uh, says that he will hold the proof. So when he has some money, he should make sure that he can prove the money belongs to him. This, this thing is basically uh, in traditional Bitcoin, it means that you need to hold your private key secretly. But actually, we are actually extending this assumption more and more. Like in pay to script hash, you should also keep a script secretly. And in some other things, in, for example, in Lightning Network, you should also actively check on the main chain, see if the people send you money is cheating, and you should respond on that within a certain period of time. And that is all falls into the rationality of holding values. So basically, we are not making more assumptions than uh, they should be. We just uh, summarize and formalize the assumptions that people already been made in multiple works. Uh, ah, here it is. 
<laughs> okay, so now we are talking about our system. Uh, before we talk about our system, there I, I will need to talk about my missing slides here. So, so the the things that we are trying to do is the same. So we try to scale out. We try to make sure that the system will still work uh, even uh, without that uh, each node having the whole uh, uh, keep the whole transaction records. But what we are doing here, so what is the cost? What is the sacrifice we make? It's not on centralization, uh, decentralization. It's not on security, but we make a sacrifice, on, make an assumption on uh, functionality. So we are design a system for value transfer. And because we are de uh, design a system for value transfer, we can use the rationality assumptions. And because of that, we will show that uh, the value transfer can be done securely and decentralizedly, uh, even without, uh, well, yeah, even if nodes only uh, record, uh, acquire part of the transaction set. Yeah, so the first change we want to make is uh, actually in the name of the value-centric blockchain is that we do not see the states as account and balance anymore, but we use some uh, older uh, representations as eCash, so we see them as coins and their owners. That's another way to, do, uh, to, to describe a value distribution, right? So they are, so at each state, there are a lot of coins in the network and they have owners, and associate with uh, each value, each ownership of value, there is a proof. So basically, if you sum up all the proofs, uh, it is the whole transaction set because the the whole transaction set will prove at each state which coin belongs to whom. But if you separate the the whole transaction set, you will have the proof for individual values. And eventually, the system uh, achieve the system uh, achieve is the last line is that we we will have the system that rational owner well nodes only need to store the proofs of the values that they own. And even if they, so they don't care about the proofs that uh, other values, they only store the values that the, uh, the nodes that they own, but still we can guarantee a secure value transfer because nodes are rational. Uh, so how is that done? Uh, so the system is very simple. You probably think it's too simple to be true, but yeah, so we call it Vapor. It comes out of the uh, first letter from some of the key elements we use in the system. It's also that I couldn't find a better name, so I just uh, make this out. Uh, yeah, so the structure is similar to some off-chain schemes. So there is a main chain. We assume the main chain reaches BFT uh, in a certain way. Either it is permission or permissionless. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's just a, a, a place that people reach consensus on something. And then every node, made their own transaction blocks. And periodically, they send a s signature of their transaction block to the main chain to reach consensus. And then, uh, when Alice wants to send some money to Bob, uh, what would he do is, uh, yeah, what would she do if she's honest? How can she prove that this money is real? Uh, it's very simple. So the first thing is that, okay, the money is real when I received it. And here are my transaction blocks, which I didn't spend this money. And then it's a green block, which contains a transaction saying that I sent this money to Bob. And then all this, because Alice, honest, uh, Alice is honest, she sent all of these things to uh, these blocks to the main chain to reach consensus. And he will send to Bob saying like, look, this is my public key. You can check that all these blocks are sealed, so I cannot change it. I cannot temper it, and you see that I haven't spent this money and before I send it to you. And this is my proof. And Bob will then uh, put this uh, inside this uh, proof, uh, and then this, this hole becomes the proof that Bob saying that this is, the money is true when I received it. And so if there is a malicious guy, Charles, and he wants to uh, cheat Bob, so, he, uh, so what can he do? He can either say that this money wasn't real when I received it, so he wants to spend the fake money, or he tried to double spend. So either he uh, sent this money to Bob and later on want to send it to someone else, or he had already sent this money and he now uh, want to make Bob believe that he haven't sp spent this money before. But he cannot do so. Uh, 
because all of these blocks are sealed, and also Bob will check this uh, thing, uh, this proof. And the only thing that Charles can do is basically not showing Bob the, pro uh, b the proof, but as a regional sender, as I said, why would you like to throw away money? So it's, okay, so this, I think pe some people will still think this scheme is too simple to be true. So what is the trade-off we are making? So I want to make a, a theoretical uh, explanation. So with the main chain, how this thing is different from uh, 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 main ch so from putting all the transactions on the main chain. Uh, the major difference is, uh, is that uh, in the classical blockchain, if you put all the transactions on the main chain, uh, you guarantee two things, which is one, the first one is consistency, the second one is liveness. And consistency means that two honest nodes cannot see a transaction in a different way, cannot have disagreement. And liveness means an honest node, if he makes a transaction, it will be known by all honest nodes in a certain period of time. And in our system, uh, because we put the transactions off chain, we still guarantee uh, consistency via the main chain because still like two honest nodes, if they see one transaction, they cannot see it in a different way. But the thing is we do not guarantee liveness. So there is no guarantee that a transaction uh, would ever be known by all honest nodes. But what we, how can we guarantee liveness is by the rationality assumption. So the liveness is always true uh, between a rational sender and a rational receiver. And we think this is already enough, sufficient for a value transfer system. And okay, so how is this whole system look like? Uh, how many time do I have? Uh, you have about 10 minutes left. Good. Okay, so how is the whole system look like? Uh, so as I said, all, each node only need to hold value of his uh, own, uh, uh, proof of his own values. Uh, but what is a proof? As I said, if you sum up all the proofs, it will be the whole transaction set. So as I like there are certain, let's see these are the transaction blocks and these are the nodes, so this will be the whole transaction set. And uh, a proof will be look like this. So basically node one holds a certain value for two, for two blocks and then he sends his value to node two and then node two hold it for three blocks and send it to node three. And for at the node three uh, point of view, uh, he okay, he has these uh, three values, so he needs these blocks as his, uh, the, all the things that he needs uh, for the proof of his own values. So this looks much smaller than the whole transaction set, right? But I'm cheating here because it doesn't guarantee that the nodes actually will have this. So it could turn out that the, the, the nodes will have a certain set of value. Eventually, he still need the whole transaction set. So our system gives no gain at all uh, over traditional system. But uh, we can never actually we can never prove that. So in a very complicated situation, and uh, also like Philip said a little bit uh, about it. So if all the so if all the transactions are cross shard transactions, like uh, well in in like in omniledger or any sharding schemes. Uh, so in a very extreme case, you cannot get any gain. And, and in our system as well. So if the, if the, the values are always travels around the whole network, and each node always holds the, a, a set of values, which the all travels around the whole network, then the system will not get any gain. But what we can prove that is in many systems, we do gain something. So we do have a, a, have a more scalable, uh, we, we can call it scale out, but uh, it uh, has a, a some difference from the scale out that uh, uh, EPFL people has introduced. And but the thing is, we allow something called spontaneous sharding. So what is spontaneous sharding? So now node three has these three uh, values. He and he want to make a transaction to node five. And which one do you think he will use to send this transaction to? So. I think the orange one, right? Because he knows that node five already knows the three blocks. So if he's rational, another kind of rational, so he will try to minimize his communication cost. And then he will turn to use the values that the nodes already, the receiver that's already familiar with to send the transaction, which means that the, no, uh, the values will turn to only cycle in a small group of the node instead of the whole network. 
and its equivalent uh, situation as a sharding. So each value forms a shard, and each node will, uh, depending on which values he have, he is kind of uh, uh, participating in different type of, uh, different shards. And this sounds a little bit too fairy tale, uh, like a fairy tale saying that okay, so if every node, uh, every node acts uh, rationally. And then we will have a very good word that the, we have this sharding scenario. And we have this question before. People said, do, does that fall into the tragedy of the common problem? So uh, do you only achieve sharding when every node works rationally? In fact, it doesn't. So uh, even if all the network is messed up and the transactions always, so the value doesn't form a shard, but it goes through the whole network. But if at a certain moment, me and David said, OK, we make rapid transactions, or frequent transactions. Let's now start to make a shard. So we only use a certain value back and forth. Then we improve our throughput. So it means that each small groups can always uh, improve throughput by uh, kind of using this rational, uh, rational behavior. And so let's compare it to normal sharding. So as for normal sharding, what we are trying to do is that we artificially divide the shard either randomly or, uh, or, uh, or predefined. And then we try to make sure that all shards are secure. And we, are, uh, we need some global, uh, well, not, not really global consensus. Global consensus is the worst case. But we need some uh, additional mechanism to keep inter-shard transaction uh, is secure. Uh, so our system is equivalent to that, that each value form spontaneously form a shard. And the shard is naturally secure, uh, secure because all the nodes validate it when they receive the value. And if the, they are rational, they will do it right. And there will n be no inter-shard transactions because basically you transact inter-shard makes it, that node comes into the shard. And this another uh, advantage we want to address, address a little bit called decentralization is actually follows the, uh, what Mustafa has just said. So we want nodes to be able to uh, individually uh, validate a transaction, uh, which is actually not the case for, uh, for, for many blockchains, uh, high throughput blockchains proposed uh, recently. So what does that mean? So you can have a consensus algorithm that scales to 10,000 of nodes and it's completely uh, decentralized. You don't need to trust anyone. But if your blockchain actually requires a high, very high bandwidth and very high uh, performance, uh, high, very high capacity uh, server, then it means that normal nodes will naturally shut out from the consensus. So I think one very important criteria of the decentralization is the participation threshold. So a node should be able to participate into the blockchain even if they have a low capacity. And in our system, it, it achieves that. So uh, the most important thing I want to emphasize is the validation thing. So if you only have one value or if you only have two coins, you actually have a very, you, you don't need a lot of uh, bandwidth and uh, uh, storage to validate uh, your two coins without relying on any full nodes or any other nodes. You can do that by your own. And I think that is a very good property to have. The last one I want to, it's a kind of a, okay, this is the last slide. Okay, this is a, a bit vague uh, phenomenon, but we still want to point it out. Uh, it's about the flexibility. So let's assume, uh, let me tell you what would happen if a shard, oh, no, sorry, uh, a fork happens in our system. So if two group of nodes have a disagreement on the validation of a certain transaction, for example, if a DAO uh, instance happens in Vapor, so uh, there are certain transactions that uh, one group want to re-roll and this, uh, want to roll back, the second, uh, the, the other group want to proceed, what will happen is that they will have an implicit fork in this system. They will have disagreement on the validity of certain value and eventually it will fork. But the thing is, uh, both groups will still contribute to the security of the main chain. So later on, in both groups, if you want to do a double spending attack, you still need to uh, beat the majority of the whole, uh, whole the well, majority of the whole population. And I will say this is a very good uh, uh, property, in fact, because 
you can never prevent people from disagreement with each other, right? You, you can never uh, prevent that. Well, but in this system, we have a minimum layer of cons uh, consensus, which is the main chain. And all the higher layer of consensus, you put it uh, in, in, well, in, let's say, off chain. And then uh, if people have a disagreement on the higher layer of consensus, they can still agree on the basic layer of consensus. I think that is an uh, advantage instead of a dis disadvantage. And OK, I'll <laughs> skip that slide. And that's all for my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gigi. That was very interesting. Uh, do we, oh, we have a question right there at the back. Uh, Mustafa? Sorry, I think I might have missed this from your talk. But how did you say that? You prevent double spend attacks if um, so. If each person is running their own chain with their own transactions, what happens if I tell um, do a double spend attack from that? Excuse so, me, I didn't think I. So I think I missed. How did you how do you prevent double spend attacks from by using transaction fees? So how do I prevent double spending attack? Uh, so as. Uh, so I basically send you a transaction, and you will only believe that I have sent, made the transaction to you when you see that I haven't spent it to someone else. And all of these transactions, I, you can see from my transaction block, which is sealed by uh, uh, a key that I send to the main chain, which you already have consensus of. Uh, but so every time I spend a transaction, I have to send it to the main chain? So, Excuse me? So every time I, 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 have to, I want to send money, Mm -hmm. I have to send my transaction to the main chain. Uh, you need to send a key of the transaction block to the main chain. So no, you sorry, not key. A signature signing your transaction block to the main chain okay, to make but, transaction. But the transaction block itself, the data of the transaction block, isn't on the main chain, and the block could the block itself could contain transactions mm -hmm. that do double spending, right? Yeah. So then, so then, then doesn't that still allow, doesn't isn't double spending still possible? Mm, no, because I need to send the block to you, so you will check whether I have sp spent the oh, money before. But so you, okay, so then the person you're sending to the transaction to checks your block, mm -hmm. but then don't they have to also check the history to to make sure there's no yeah. I, I also send the 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 all the blocks that's uh, after I receive the money. After you receive no, but then you have to check the history. Yeah, the okay. history the, is actually, so uh, uh, the history is basically other people haven't spent the money before. Okay, but then don't you have to verify the whole UTXO set back to the Genesis block? Uh, yes. But then doesn't, that, doesn't, then doesn't that effectively, isn't that roughly the same amount of, isn't that roughly the whole UTXO set anyway? Uh, in fact, oh, okay. Well, as this slide suggests, you, you, you send a certain, it is certain blocks, but it is not the whole transaction set. But at a certain scenario, as I said, it, you, you probably will have the whole transaction set in the end. Yeah, so aren't you assuming that basically that if, if you look at the whole UTXO graph, it's not interlinking? So like, if the, UT, if, if the money is very fungible, and there's lots of people sending transactions to each other. Yeah, firstly, yeah. it will be a little bit different from UTXO because it will not be as fungible as uh, UTXO. And we do not actually know what would happen uh, in, in real life because it's a very theoretical paper. And also, uh, yeah, so the worst scenario is that money got around the world and you eventually need the whole set. Is that your worry? Yeah, but uh, that's something that we can show that under a certain scenario, we got benefit, but we are not sure whether in real life it will have benefit. But we are quite confident that uh, in some scenario, it will be better. Interesting, thank you. Were there any further questions? Uh, yes, here. So just to add, does the sender decide what blocks to send? Uh, yes. I think there was one further question at the back there. Uh, the microphone's right behind you. Hi, uh, great talk. Can we follow the developments on this uh, somewhere? Uh, this, paper uh, uh, this paper is available online. 
and uh, the we 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 don't have a, uh, a implementation of this yet. We we have an implementation of our uh, my previous paper, which is similar to this, but we don't have an implementation of this yet. So it's kind of theoretical uh, work. Excellent. Oh, Patrick. Um, have you read the paper called PPay from like the early 2000s? That's sort of similar to this where you had like a bank and the idea is that they give me a coin and every time I spend it to you, I also have to give you the history. And then when you spend it, you show the history of the coin until it eventually reaches back to the bank. Yeah, so the idea with this would be that if I give you the coin, I proved you that I got it from the bank. And then when you send it over there, you prove you received it from me and then you send it over there as well. But this mm -hmm. was only for micropayments because of the chance of double spending. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, mm, yeah, it has a similarity to some older schemes, which yeah. is even before the blockchain era. Yeah, so I recommend reading that paper. That's mostly my point. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, great. Well, if there are no further questions, we will go to a break. <laughs> <laughs>